Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. It has not been a good day for a while for our Philadelphia Flyers, as I'm joined by the wonderful Flyers fan, Mania 93, who I love how he kept the name after the great Jake Voracek moved on to Columbus, too. But uh, joined by Chris Mayer, as I'm Joe Borick, as we're here to get this edition of The Grittiest Take, as we talk about the recent struggles of our Philadelphia Flyers. But overall in life, Chris, not about this team that's in a hellhole right now. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks for reaching out. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's, you know, for me, it's been, it's been all right. Um, obviously, the team struggles have kind of led over to some frustration, and um, it hasn't been too fun. But overall, I've been doing well. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just uh, hoping they can uh, start playing some good hockey again. Yeah, I hope so, because obviously, like Jason tweeted out a couple days ago now, might have been like four days ago now, but if you look at it compared to the other seasons a couple of years ago, there's been ruts and curves, but because of last year, obviously we're going to look at everything as more damning, because last year was down, 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 once it went down, nothing came up, where you have that now view in your mind that as soon as it starts going down, you're like, crap, this is just not where if it was like more like two years ago and you had an uptick last year, you probably wouldn't have the same views. Now, what's your take on kind of the philosophy of people's views with that? Because it seems like that is a good point. Your views do change season by season. If your last season was due to, you're going to have more views. Ah, crap. We're going downhill. This is not going to be good a lot earlier. No, for sure. I mean, look, Last season, I, I personally want to just get last season out of my mind, but I can't because a lot of what I'm seeing from this season is basically carrying over. Um, it, it's a very similar start, if I'm being honest with you. It's If you think about last season, they were scoring goals early. They were getting really good goaltending. This year, starting you know started with getting a lot of goals. Um, Carter Hart was making a lot of saves. Martin Jones kept him in some games. Um, and it, it felt like as the games were going on, we obviously knew that, that this team wasn't going to score at a four, four, I think it was a what, 4.6 goal pace. They were yeah, scoring. it was above a 4.5 pace. Yeah, it, it was, it was out, outrageous how much they were scoring goals and some of their chances weren't even that great. They were just finding net, um, you know, but, you know, they were able to create high danger chances. They scored on them if they got them off the rush and things like that. And now that they're not scoring goals, majority of their chances are one and done. Um, they don't have as much as own time. They're having turnovers in their own zone, especially in the last three games. Um, and overall, they just haven't played the, the best hockey. And it, it, it's been a problem when the power play, which I think we could have in an entire like four hour episode on just talking about the power play, but um, the power play is, is so bad that it's, it's leaning into their five on five play. I mean, last yeah. night against the Rangers alone, like I, I'm at the point now, like, like Bill Maltzer put out a tweet earlier um, and I'm going to pull it up. Um, it might take me a minute here to pull it up because I didn't have it ready. Cause I didn't think I was going to talk about it, but anyway, um, he put a tweet up. Uh, here it is. The Flyers get zero credit for falling behind three nothing, quote unquote, almost scoring on a five minute power play and ultimately having a five on five puck possession edge against the 31 ranked puck possession team. It wasn't even a baby step in the right direction. It was unacceptable. That's exactly a majority of what I was thinking, especially with the power play, because you cannot have a five minute power play in a three nothing game. And you can't score. It, it, it's just, it's not acceptable at this point in the season when you're already on a six game exactly. losing streak going into this game. And then, like, you can't keep looking for the baby step or the motivation that you need to score. They, I, I'm tired of the, oh, well, they're getting chances and, oh, well, they're doing this. It doesn't matter. They're not scoring. You know, the last night they score one goal. Um, I think the last time, I think, uh, Joe, what is it? Like two games in their last 17, they've scored three or more goals. Yeah. Yeah, it's something like that. It's an absolute. I can pull up the schedule now, but um, yeah, to look back at it, but I might be wrong on that. I think it might be like Carolina. Games. We scored three goals. Um, Tampa, we lost four to three. But other than that, the Flyers since even the beginning of November, they beat after they beat Arizona three nothing, three to two loss, two to one win. So that's two goals. 3-0 loss, 2-1 to one win, 5-2 to two loss, 2-1 to one win. They got three against Tampa, 
five two loss to Boston, four zero loss, two to one loss, six to three loss, and then five to two loss. Yeah. So in all of November, they really, other than two games, one being a win and one being a loss, um, did not even get to the three goal threshold, and of course did not get close to it against the Rangers. But right. I mean, come into that game, and it's because of how we played. It's an excusable level of play. I mean, I kind of said it when I did my preview. I thought we were going to get like, like I, I basically said it. The only way the Flyers are winning this game is if Carter Hart steals on the, the game. I did not think they had any chance with how New York was playing this mm-hmm. year, with how they're playing this year. I mean, you have guys. We've seen it in the past when our team's churning. When you're churning, you have guys move up in the lineup, add energy, jump in, do well. Well, what team do you see that happening with this year? Of course, you got a boarding penalty, which is not a nice thing. But Dryden Hunt's a guy that moved up in the lineup because the, they just have that energy going. They just have that ride the energy wave going, the New York Rangers this year. Where the Flyers have had that in years past, they have none of that this year where it's like once something goes down the hill, it Everything, just keeps yeah. riding down the hill. Yeah. Right, and, and that's what last year was. It was like one thing went bad, then everything started. Like everything that could have went wrong for them last year went wrong for them. And in this year, it's it's you, you it feels like they're getting more of that on the injury side. It's like last night they get Kevin Hayes back. Well, then Joel Farabee goes out with an injury, and still haven't heard any update on it. It doesn't seem like it's gonna it's good. Um, it didn't look good. Yeah, he was slouched yeah. over when he was yeah. waiting for them to open that door because that MSG for people that don't know it's not connected. Mm-hmm. So the player has to skate to the door, and he was like this, like yeah. waving the guy. Yeah. To open the door. So that did not look like a good shoulder or whatever. He knocked out of place there. No, for sure. And, you know, he, he went out for a shift after. He couldn't even grip a stick. So th- th- that right there kind of shows you it didn't, it, it wasn't good. Um, and if the Flyers have, I, I already thought they should have made a trade to begin with. Um, but if they lost Farabee, they have to make a move. You can't play without one of your better younger wingers. You can't rely on guys to keep coming up from Lehigh Valley. The only option you have from Lehigh Valley right now, besides Frost, is arguably Zamula and Allison after he plays a couple games. That's it. Nobody yeah. else is coming up from the Phantoms. They're all struggling down there. You, you're, it's. I personally would rather see Ratcliffe than Bunneman in the lineup, if I'm being honest with you. Um, That's just I, roster structure because mm-hmm. Isaac doesn't play a lot of center. So that's kind of a roster structure. Yeah, type. but but he he could he could play center. It's not like he hasn't done it before. Um, I believe he played center in junior. He um, yeah he had, no he has played center. It's just with the Phantoms he hasn't really played. Like he only takes faceoffs if people get kicked out, and he has to take faceoffs type thing, or if he rotates into center during the course of the game. But no, I agree with you. I just feel like like I said earlier. I think it's a lot more systematic because what I've saw of Bunny and Scott Gordon's system when he was going at right and they were running a good system in the minors because newsflash for people that don't know the Flyers system is run the same way pretty much with the Phantoms this year with Laffey and it's not working down there either. Um, I don't think they're putting guys in the best spot where Bunny, I still think, like I wrote in my article on Nitty Gritty, has a chance to be Nate Thompson-like if he gets developed right. Where the Flyers have failed a lot of their guys in the last couple years when it comes to putting them in the best spots to right. and the best line structure for them to actually play to the best of their abilities. Um, where, like, for example, you should have added a little bit more defense. Like, I was kind of saying this in the offseason, like even a Matt Benning or somebody that's just more known to be able to mix into a defense for 30 games if needed and not a guy that you're going to want to rely on full-heartedly but just mix in because – like you said in your tweet, if you would have told me Nick Sewell would have been the first line defenseman coming into the season, and then on top of being the first line defenseman, the relied upon defenseman yeah. in the third period against the damn Rangers, then I would have thought that you must have fell down 17 flights of stairs before you made that statement. Because like that's what it's come to now. You have a guy that you're shot blocking, just hitting lefty defenseman that's been yeah. a great AHL in his career, but just to rotate in and out NHL. Yeah. So and now it's so one dim- yeah, he, yeah. He's just, he's so one dimensional. It's like, you can't, you can't rely on that. And I get it. They're trying to, I don't know if they're trying to get Provorov going. Cause he really was going beforehand, but like, I feel like they're just trying to mix it up. Cause he hasn't looked great in the last couple of games. He's no, had some Proby turnovers. Either, no. Um, 
And, and it's not just him. It, it's a lot of guys. And again, I, I hate sitting here and essentially, you know, just talking smack on the team because nobody wants to do that. And it's, it's very hard. Again, everybody knows how I am usually with this team. I try to be as positive as possible, but same here, but it's so, hard to find it. Yeah. Right. It's hard to find it when you've lost seven in a row and, and you're struggling and, um, you're five on five. You're not, and power play have struggled, which is right. A double you're not scoring. Game. You're right. You're half your special teams. The only thing that actually has looked better, the penalty kills look really good. They're getting better goaltending. I feel like they've defended the middle of the ice for a majority of the, uh, out of the 21 games. They've done it pretty well. Um, there's been some hiccups here and there, especially in the last few, as I mentioned before, but um, I have really liked the way that they've defended in the middle of the ice. Cause that was Joe, as you know, that was a huge issue last season. Um, oh, people could enter the zone. Like it was Swiss. Oh, dude, our, our the, team last dude year. the team bus outside could have fit through their seams last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was just, it was horrible. So, I mean, it is what it is, but um, right now it's, it, it's concerning with this team. Um, I don't know what, happens i i feel like again i think they have to make a trade but we'll see well let me ask you then because at this point of the season it's usually if you make trades now they're not like the other than obviously we saw the eichel trade but that's because he was demanding out that was a completely different situation you don't normally see the massive guys one get moved in season or two if they do get moved until closer to the deadline who's really in the realistic pointer now like obviously strome's been rumored to get out of chicago but that's more of a middle way trade because he hasn't been the same he's he's a guy that again people think is in a systematically bad spot but then we're bringing him into a system that's not working here so is that really gonna be something that works because it seems like those middle wave moves are the moves that people would make more now in the season point you're in rather than the big ones minus eichel which was just a complete outlier situation right well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you feel like if they're going to make a move, I think they go for a guy like, like if you 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 have to trade with another struggling team, like Vancouver. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago on my podcast with Yuri Wallach, um, we had Jason Martinez on, and somebody in our comment section brought up J T. Miller, and I was like, boom, that's perfect. He's a center. He's uh, is has an affordable contract, and I believe he's a UFA after the season. So if you don't oh, resign it, like like if they, if they were going to go for Tomas Hurdle. Which we've heard, not really heard, but Flyers fans have mentioned in on in, in Twitter land. Yeah. Um, that would be more of an off season thing, in my opinion. I, I don't see them going for Tomas Hurdle right now, um, because you ha- probably have to offload a good amount to get Hurdle. If I'm being honest with you, if they were to try to, um, I, I really don't know what else they they could get. I mean, if anything, uh, they need real to have. Quick. He does have next year JT Miller also, but it's not for a bad cap hit. It's for the same five point two five. So I mean, yeah, you can fit that in, right? And 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 that's that's a very good um, contract for JT Miller. I mean, he's a very good player. He's, he's one of the more underrated centers in in the league. Yeah. So I mean, that goal he scored one the other night. Yeah, yeah, that was disgusting. Um, he's a very, very good player, and I would seriously love to see him in a Flyers uniform. I don't know what they give up. Um, It'll probably take I, a bit, yeah. I, I feel like you'd have to move JVR just for the contract to, to, to at least <laughs> agree. Bring in yeah. the salary. Um, for salaries, it's obviously not the only thing that's going to go. It's going to have to be something else, probably another another one or two roster players and a pick. Um, depending Depending on what happens, because he's a very good player for Vancouver, and they are struggling, and they're probably going to want somebody back too that can do something for them. Um, since they're having similar struggles, probably worse than the Flyers. But um, yeah, it's it, it's. I, I really don't know what they do specifically, but they need to do something and do it quick. I know, obviously, Chuck has been talking. There's Dvorak not working in Montreal. He's for something a year. I think he has more years than JT Miller, but that's something I was just thinking it could be a possibility if. The Flyers went that route because he does yeah. have a cheap contract in all things considered with the way the right. market is. I, I personally believe they need more of an offensive spark, a guy that can shoot. I'm not, not saying Dvorak can't shoot or anything like that, but a guy who's known for for shooting, yeah. um, just kind of more of an offensive all-around game. Um, that, probably, that, that wouldn't be too bad of an option either. 
No, that's what, like, I feel like JT Miller for me would be the option. I agree with you. I would really want because he has, he kind of fits it all. But that's kind of what I was getting at. I don't know how many teams make those fits at all trades this early in the season when normally it's more of the who's the best guy out there that a team will trade now type type move where if the Vorax not working out when they made the move for him where that was one of the moves people went, oh, this is a good replacement piece for Cock and Yemi letting him go. Right. They might decide to move on from him. Or um, obviously Dylan Strom is in the – way of getting sent out eventually in Chicago, you would think, which would be better for him and his career because he's not in the best spot right now. That's like a middle wave move that you see happening at this time of the season. That's why I'm curious. Like, I would love JT Miller to happen now. I just don't know if the Canucks would do that yet or wait on JT Miller, particularly realizing he does have next year um, on his contract still. Right. No, for sure. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of different factors that will play into it. Yeah. But um, the Flyers this year, I think one of our biggest issues, of course, have been – I talked about it with Yarif on Nitty Gritty, too. But, like, we've been just doing this – like like you said, when we're at our best, we're one of the better teams at cycling the puck. But that doesn't mean – cycling the puck doesn't mean dump and chase with a bunch of people that you don't have that box people out, unless if your name is Zach McEwen, to get to the puck. Like, you have – it's always one guy going into the zone, and then other people either staying back or line changing. Like, how do you expect to win the, win the puck? What do yeah, you take on, like, this dump and chase system that clearly just isn't working? Yeah, I mean, they they clearly need to change something or, or just – they just don't have the – it's not even that they don't have the talent or the players or the guys to do it. Because, again, as I said, when they're confident and they're moving the puck and they get in there first and they create some havoc – they are arguably one of the better cycle teams in the league when they're able to do it. It's just, are they able to get into the zone? You know, is it, I think the, the one thing that's an issue was they don't get enough point shots. Every, every point shot yep. is either blocked. And if it, it doesn't get through to the net, if it's blocked or goes wide, whatever, or they go point to point and dump it back low again, it, it, it just doesn't work. And, it's not even that they can't make it work because they have the talent to make it work, but you have to make an adjustment. Like the one thing I did like in last night's game was they got through the neutral zone with speed. You saw it on the frost goal. He basically created the entire play. Um, once they're able to get those creative passes up through their own blue line and, and just kind of fly through the zone, they did that for a lot of the game, but it was the fact that you went down to nothing and gave up a goal 34 seconds into the second period. That was the dagger. In oh, that game. Yeah. It, it just wasn't enough to get them back. And Shazergan was on his head, you know, so so that was that was what that was. And um, but it, I do feel like the, their losing streak is going to come to an end soon. I felt like against the Devils, they had a good amount of offensive chances to score. But Blackwood was pretty good and they just didn't necessarily score. Um, and against uh, the Rangers last night, again, as I said, Shazergan was fantastic and they couldn't score. I mean, like that power play. The five minute major had seven shots. And yeah. it, 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 again, I get it. You can't sit here and look at it as like a, you know, as a momentum boost or whatever, because you can't rely on that right now. It's not like we're in October and they've lost, I don't know, maybe two out of three games. Like, no, like we're in December already. They're on a seven game losing streak. Like, yeah. You can't keep relying on that stuff. So um, they, they need to finish. And, and I think that's coming soon, but we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, maybe this is the season, unlike the one season we ended up falling because of our losing streak and the standings did not make the playoffs. Right. Maybe this is the season we can do the reverse <laughs> and go maybe. on a really bad losing streak then go on a really good winning streak sometime in, like, January. You're right around Christmas would be nice. That's my birthday, so that'll be a good time, Flyers, just, just letting you know. Um, but when it comes to last night, yeah, I would say you did see more chances on that 5 on 3 but it's kind of like what you said earlier in the video – and Al Morgani pointed out on the um, broadcast, who's hilarious sometimes with how uh, he just kind of relates analogies to things. But um, like you're kind of beyond the point of this is good, this is good to build from, this is good to build from, because you're on a seven game losing streak. Once you're like, if you're on like you said a two out of three or even a three game losing skid, you would still be like, well, we did X, Y, and Z that we can really take out of the game where this is the points where you're like breaking your stick over your life. <laughs> like you're just like frustrated and 
pissed off that you can't really figure it out or if you're Carter yeah. Hart like Jamie said throwing your pad halfway across the lot <laughs> like yeah. like it's like somebody else do it right where yeah you're just not like at a point of saying we can take this stuff and have solace and compassion and like basically for ourselves and just be content with to move on from now we just have to really figure it out and Drew's echoed that anytime he's talked since the uh, losing streak and so so have others that uh, Hayes said it when he first came back. He's like, it's the next man up uh, mentality. Like, you basically can't use injuries as no. an excuse, especially when you see other teams going through COVID, going through injuries, whatever, with the protocols and everything, and they're still moving along better than the Flyers. So you can't use that as an excuse. No, for sure. I mean, it's it's not even an excuse. It It, it is a legit factor, but it's not the answer to their problem. You know, and no. they are having injuries and they are having guys that are out of the lineup. And, we're not Ryan Ellis. and the other thing is we're not scoring, but Hayes is a great two way center. It's not like Hayes is yeah. a 85 to 95 point center that all of a sudden when he comes into the lineup is going to like that. But he does fix. provide more offense. Oh, he does. Yeah, but it's he's, not like we're at he's a game. much better yeah. play driver than, say, Broussard. Who no, is, I agree with that, but it's not like if you're Pittsburgh when a guy like Malkin comes back, who at one time was that 100-point guy and still has sight lines of being it when he's healthy and you still see the like flashes of it. They're not the same type of offensive guy because Hayes is a great two-way guy if Kenny Malkin isn't. So, like, I'm saying, like, the Flyers at this point, like, if the Flyers did, for example, make a trade, obviously we never did it for Goudreau, with how he's playing this year, I've kind of been saying it alone. We have enough guys that play good two-way games. You develop Morgan Frost into playing a better two-way game in the Myers, and you're trying to still do that. You did it with Lawrence, uh when he didn't become the offensive guy. You thought he'd turn him into a hell of a two-way player. So mm-hmm. that can happen. We don't need as many. You can do it on both sides anymore. We just need somebody that drives a play and scores a puck and passes it with the best of them. If you had Goudreau the way he's playing this season, also he's looked better in Sutter's system defensively because he's bought him into it a little bit. Right. That would have worked fine because the Flyers just need somebody that's an offensive juggernaut, which he fits into the category of, if you're not great defensively, I don't love it, but if everybody else is pulling the part and you're on a line with two good defensive players also that get back, back check well, then that's fine because we really just need that juggernaut offensive extra component yeah. at this point. I, I, I personally feel like they have that already. Their system just does, just prevents them from doing it. A lot of their goals they're scoring is because of talent. I also meant from the yeah. I also meant like a juggernaut offensive guy from the wing because I feel like we do have it if Cooch is going at his best at center. Um, if he if like you said, Hazy's a play driver, but G's going at his best at Can center. Be, yeah, like th- yeah. there's other guys. They have the talent to do it, but their system doesn't let them. Like it, it all the goals they're scoring are because of talent. If you go back, you look at the two goals they scored against New Jersey. They were all. Town based law in the shorthanded f- and Farabee got the bounce off of a of a turnover behind the net and even maybe, yesterday uh, you, you wanna... could say Frost was town based because it's what yeah they... the backhand pass the pass yeah. in front and he got there first also it, stick it's... checking a couple nice stick checks in the zone mm-hmm. to get it off of the opposing players so they could even get those opportunities so. right and then and then even if you go back to the, the Carolina game on Black Friday you have the really nice pass from Drew to Provorov. Faraby going, you know, end to end shorthanded. And then you have the rest of the line and goal, which is a great pass from Frost at found net. So mm-hmm. it, it's things like that. They're scoring because of talent. They're not scoring because of their system. And their their power play system is a problem. Like if you go and you look at the last four minutes of that game, you don't pull the goaltender when you're down two goals, right? With four minutes left, you have a power play. The fact that they didn't pull Carter Hart off of the draw. It's still mind-boggling to me at this moment. You already had the advantage, and then they lose the face-off. That's the funny thing about it. They still lose the face-off. Then they waited till 10 seconds left of the power play when they had two shifts with around a minute 30 and then 50 seconds where they had legit possession. Didn't pull Hart. Pulled them, as I said, with 10, 10 seconds left, mind you. 10 seconds in the power yeah, play. Yeah, that's already, enough. we're up a guy. Let, let, you know, let, let's not add another guy out there to make it harder for ourselves. Um, and then... They just are stuck in their own zone, and the Rangers win a puck battle and score the empty netter. I, it's like I don't – if that doesn't tell you coaching is a problem and they're putting the players in positions, that it's like they make it harder for them. That is a prime example of it right well, there. Well, I think another example of coaching is a problem is 
if you have the coaches we saw, Chuck Fletcher AV, it was reported, got together to form the roster that the coaching staff kind of wanted to have put together, bringing these new players that they thought would work well for them. And then it hasn't. So, like, if you if you if it didn't work well with the old squad last year, now you bring in a bunch of new guys, like we said, like nine new players. That shows even more that it's coaching too, because these guys, like you said, have got it done. Atkinson, whether it was in um, Columbus, Risto's a little bit of a different story because of Buffalo. So we'll just leave that alone. Um, but and then Broussard in other um, cities has got it done, particularly with AV. Uh, he's had very good success. So he's the only one that's really come in and actually from the guys you picked up worked to the realm that you really like. Because McEwen, you wouldn't really fit into that category of what AV and Fletcher got together on because they picked him up late and so same with Patrick Brown. So like I'm talking about just guys you got in the actual like off season, off season. Uh Sealer's a guy that's I think another guy shot blocking physical, probably somebody they discussed adding, but not thinking he would play as much. The you're you're not improving from year to year and you got a new team. That's something that usually shows it can be on the coaching a bit. But the earlier point I was making about I think we do have good play. Like we score because of skill. I'm just talking about Goudreau's skill is to the level of nine, like 85 up points, where to like even 100. Like the guy that just says, screw this, I'm t-. like he did against us. He They didn't win the game that he ended up having a lot of shots. We won two to one or whatever the score was. I think it was two to one. But Goudreau had his highest shot total, really just. He knew the Flames offense. It wasn't as the same Flames offense as this whole season. Everybody wasn't generating the same. He took it upon himself and really had a great game. That's kind of where I'm saying, like, the Flyers don't have with the injuries they've dealt with. Uh, Atkinson, at this point of his career, is not going to really be that take-it-upon-himself guy. TK's trying to get his confidence back. He's like one of those guys where when Goudreau's confident, he's just going to carry your team for a little bit. And then yeah. you don't really have to worry about the Flyers don't have someone right now with the way things are at to be able to minus G who's been trying to do it. But G, like I said on your reef, it's not fair to G to put that on him because we both talked about it. We thought Drew would be falling into more of a just being the captain, falling into place, being a very good guy that's still on a good points pace, not yeah. the leader of the entire team offensively at this point of his career. Like you need other guys to step up and have Drew be more where you want him to be at the age of 33. No, for sure. I mean, they, they, they need a, some sort of a spark. Um, I don't know what it would be, but if it's trade or coaching change or whatever, but they, they need something. Um, it, it's, it's very concerning that they're score, they, again, that they scored at that much of a pace early and now they're just not score. It just looks hard to score goals. Yeah, I mean, and then it's not getting any easier because our next uh, our next game Sunday is against the Tampa Bay Lightning, who are the back to back defending Stanley Cup champions. Uh, lost a couple people last off season, of course, like their whole fourth line, for example, but still seem to not be missing a beat at twelve five and four, playing pretty well. Plus, when you have the best goalie in the world, that certainly helps uh, your team, no matter who you lose. And then Colorado is eleven seven and one. Um, and really ha- is improving. They had McKinnon come back, and everybody's kind of fallen back into place there. And also, Pavel Francois is on conditioning, so they have both of their actual number one and one A, one B goalies back soon too. Is, is, and then Johansson will go back down. Um, so, what do you think if you had to put a percentage on it um, that the Flyers have to end their losing streak against these very tough to p- opponents? Be it at home, it'll be in the Wells Fargo Center either on Sunday against Tampa at 6 p.m. for people that don't know, since that's a different start time, or Monday at 7 p.m. versus Colorado? Zero to ten. Zero to ten, okay. So even even us that were usually the more optimistic people where – They're not winning. I don't think they're yeah. – I'm, I'm doing the game Sunday. I hope they win. I don't think they will. Monday, maybe, but – Sunday, I mean, with the way that they played against Tampa the last time, they, you got to play better than that. The one before they lost in the shootout, maybe. If they play yeah. like that, yeah. They play yeah. like that, and, and maybe, you know, I believe Point's still injured. I know Kucherov is still injured. Um, yeah, Point's out for a bit, yeah. I know Kucherov is still out for a while. So we'll see. But regardless of those guys are still out, 
you know, the Flyers still didn't necessarily play good. I mean, Barkov was out against Florida, and they didn't look good in that game either. So, realistically, it doesn't matter. The Flyers have to play better as a team, and I feel like a couple days off can help them. So, maybe. I mean, look, anybody can win in this league. It, it's There really is no easy game in the NHL anymore. Like, I think everybody talks about that Arizona game too much. Like, I I, I the Flyers won 3 nothing, and I felt like they dominated more of the, most of the game. It was just the first period was kind of back and forth. That was it. Like, you, you knew at some point Arizona was going to win a game. And it wasn't the fact of, yeah. like, you know, the Flyers are going into it and they're playing Arizona. And that and the goaltender, Vimelka, was fantastic. And he did it before against Carolina and Washington in previous games, the two games before that for Arizona. And they almost won those games. They lost 2 nothing and 2-1. So, you know, it, it, was, it was pretty close. And the Flyers... Basically, one it was three nothing, but really two nothing with an empty netter. Um, but three nothing, and you know, it is what it is. But I, I feel like they need a legit game where they just it's not even like that they have a it's not even like a momentum builder or anything. They just need to have a game where they just go out and play, like make a couple adjustments, maybe change your system up. Um, I personally would like to see a one three one system. I think it's more it's more structured than what they're having now, and, and they're getting caught with having their wingers too high. You saw it last night on uh, the, the third goal. The Hayes and Konechny spring. Lawton flips some turnover. Kreider scores. Like you know what I mean? It's like if Lawton maybe waits a second and the other guys kind of dip back instead of going, you know. Just you know, fledged. yeah, yeah. If they just don't, you know, if they don't like just fly out of the zone, maybe they have a chance. Or Lawton maybe looks the other way to Hayes, but like, it's just things like that where if they can make adjustments and and do different things, um, they might be able to win these games. But it, look, any game is winnable. But I think at some point the the, the losing streak has to end, and it's got to come from the players. They need to figure out something with the power play and. I don't know if I mentioned it when I talked about the whole four minute thing last and third, but Drew was also on the right side for that. I don't remember if oh, I mentioned yeah. it. I might have. Make sense, yeah. Right. If you're down two goals and you have four minutes and you're in a power play, yeah, let's put Claude Drew on the right side when he's statistically a thousand times better and prefers to play on the left side. Yes. Yeah. Like it's just it's mind boggling to me. But anyway. No, they do that with multiple guys though, because sometimes Cam will be on the right side, and I'm like looking, and my one good friend that I have is a Blue Jack, has been a Blue Jackets fan and pisses me off about the Blue Jackets when we text back and forth sometimes. So I know that that from listening to him, he he's watched the team and even texted me, why is Cam Atkinson on the right side of your power play sometimes? And I'm like, your guess is as good as mine because I have no idea what, like both of those guys are better on the left and better at setting up for their one-timers, not better at shooting from that side or being that they're, they're both good passes, Claude Drew and Cam Atkinson, but that's not what they want to do on the power. They just, the most content and most comfortable just firing their one-timers. And if you want to get Atkinson also, because Giroux's obviously been producing well, Atkinson's been colder lately. If you want to get him going again, the best way to get him going again is putting him in the most comfortable spot on the power play. Yeah. Uh, which that's why it is so mind boggling where the, the flyers are getting to the point of where you see, people have said in the Twitter sphere and Facebook sphere and Reddit sphere about the Phillies, where like nobody agrees with any move Joe Girardi's made in the last six weeks, where like, that's kind of what, what the flyers are getting to in these last seven games with the coaching staff. It's like the only thing I've kind of like somewhat recently is literally what just happened. I want, I'm kind of excited to see what Frost, um, Drew, and Atkinson can do as a as a line with Drew back at center because of how he's been playing this year. But it's usually if I agree with one thing, it's one literal thing. It'll be like one line. I'm like, oh, I kind of like the way that line structured, and then everything else is like you talked about at the beginning. Man, uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know about that one. I don't know about this. I don't know about how we change that. Like it's more you're getting to the question baseline, and usually when you start getting to this point. That's when this is like really the make or break time to prove who you are as the, a team, but also 
if you're the coaching staff, to prove that you still belong here and you're still the people that are going to get this team over the hump to where they need to go. Yeah, no, for sure. And you know, going back to what you're saying with the power play, like the the game that they had switched it in, and it was the Arizona game when they came home, and they switched the units. And the first power play the Flyers had that game, Atkinson was way too damn low in the slot. Mm-hmm. Or, or excuse me, not in the slot. He was in he was on the left side. He was on the on the left half wall, but he was more towards towards the circles. So like he was. Closer, but like it was basically Jerome Provar playing catch because Atkinson was too damn low to do anything. If you're going to put him in that spot, let him shoot it. I would rather have Drew there anyway because even earlier in the season, Atkinson had a couple goals and really close chances to scoring on the right side of the power play. They set it up, Broussard down low to Faraby behind the net, up to Atkinson for a one timer, and it got the defenseman to kind of pinch lower and they open up, open up the, the uh, like the just the angle for a shot. So you know, if if I'm if I'm like I just don't understand what the change was necessary for. They were scoring, but you know they were they weren't really scoring during the Western Canada trip. I believe they went over ten in those three games on the power play. Yeah, they didn't score but, on the power play up there. But they it generated momentum for them, and they would looked a lot better than it does now. I will say that. No, that is true. I mean, I feel like though. If it comes to Cam and Drew, if you want them to have the most success shooting on the power play, they can't be on the same power play. What, like, Drew has to be on the one, and then Cam has to be on the two unit, because you're not going to be able to set two people up in Ovechkin's spot on the left side to fire one-timers. That's physically impossible. So, like, I, I feel like there's rotations that could work. Frost is obviously a very good passer, so you could put him with Cam on the second unit. He can get it across to him. And then you can fire it away um, from there. Obviously, Joel was a guy that would have been expected to be mixed in there as well to be able to do that. But if he's injured now, we'll have to see what comes with him. But another thing to point out from the Rangers game, I hate pointing out what our rival did successfully. Um, but it's something that would play into what the Flyers can do successfully. That power play goal, you talked about not getting enough shots through from the point. For me, it's not getting enough shots from the point, choosing the wrong shot, like you mentioned, when you're shooting into people. But also, just stop looking for the 14-carat gold shot. Like, Truba, that's not a that's not a shot that's brilliantly great. Like, he just saw people were screened in front. He had a chance to get it on net, and he had a chance to make a play because the goaltender was screened and shot yeah. it. The Flyers yeah, have yeah. those opportunities a lot and don't take them. Don't you think that's a good power play our team can learn from seeing the yeah, Rangers kind of sure. cycle it, the puck? Because it's just simple. Like they got it was the last thirty seconds of it where the Flyers dominated and on, on the penalty kill and they were able to, to shut them down. But when I'm looking at it now, it's like I'm looking at at the shot um from Truba now, and it was just a double screen in front. And mm-hmm. it was it was simple. It was Pass is over, and they got a shot from the point. The Flyers don't use the point well on the power no, play. No, not at all. No. Especially with Provorov out there, like he doesn't. He's just very like unaware of of the situation, and he kind of just holds it too long. And Yandel, I don't mind, but he, I'd rather, you know, I, I actually really like Yandel doing the power play. He just doesn't necessarily shoot as much as I'd I, I'd like him to sometimes. Um, but they don't have a legit shooter on the power play, and I I, I never understood the whole. Um, power play being predictable thing for teams because the Capitals have literally had the exact same power play set up for an entire decade. And it still works to this day because you have that many lethal weapons on it from Backstrom, Kuznetsov, Oshie, Carlson, obviously Ovechkin on his side. And if it's not open, they go to either of the other ones. And another thing is too, is all those players on that team know how to run that power play, regardless of say Backstrom's out or Oshie's out, whoever it doesn't matter. They still know how to run it and they still know how to, Use it to their advantage. So, like, I talked about this with Bill Meltzer before. The Flyers went, they had a, uh, Joe, you might remember this. I might have to, you might have to pull it up or I'll have to send it to you later. There's a clip of a goal that the Flyers scored back in the 1920 season, and it was a power play goal. It was actually Couturier's power play goal against Capitals on the road where they went 7-2. It was, like, when they were really talking about, like, o- Ovechkin scoring 700 and Giroux got his 800th point. And okay, it was a the they, they won the face off, and Voracek had it downloaded. Giroux, he was down low, and Couturier was in Giroux's spot, 
and he made a saucer pass. It was very similar to the actually the Farabee and Atkinson play that I had talked about from this season where they okay. had a couple of chances on. It was just Giroud to the right, Coots in the left, shot it, and it went right through Holby, and they scored, and it was like seven seconds in. It was a set play. I have, n- I have seen that play one time since, and I think they actually hit the post when they did it. I, it, I believe it was this season. Um, I forget what game, but it was this season, and they've never done that play again. They've never tried to set anything up for it. I get it. Giroud likes to play on the left, but if you're using him on the right, why not try to do that play again? So that's the thing. It's like at least adapt, try to use different areas of what you've done before, and that's the thing with the coaching staff. They don't go back to things that have worked. And when something clearly isn't working, they don't change it. The Farabee, Couturier, JVR line. I mean, like, like again, me and you were talking about this before we started recording. Like, they don't it, – it, it was good last year, sure, but it hasn't done – honestly, it hasn't done anything this season. JVR has scored actually one legit goal since – hasn't even scored a legit goal this entire month. He didn't score in a, a legit goal in November. The, the goal he scored against Dallas – went off the defender's hand and just rolled over the line. It wasn't like he legitimately scored. It just went off of him. And went <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just one of them like work. lucky kind of bounces. Yeah. So it, it, it's an issue when you're constantly not scoring and you're, you're, you're just not going back to things that, that, that don't work. I've said, I've been essentially crying for Limblom, Couturier, Konechny. Um, They're not giving Oscar a chance to even get going. He doesn't have a legit offensive guy that he's really playing with. And it, it's not helping him playing on the fourth line. I'm sorry. Not a fourth. I mean, he, he, he can do, he can do things that a fourth liner would do, but he's not a fourth line. He's not player. a fourth line player. Yeah, yeah, and, dude, a, anybody can do a fourth line role. It's, like, it's just, you, you can, but there's certain guys like Nate Thompson, for example, that are just like prototypical. Yeah. They just don't have the line. offense to yeah, carry it up to the, put them for the face-offs or for the hit, like Zach McEwen, for the hitting, the physical, the energy he brings to the team. You're going to love him on your fourth line. Uh, Ross Johnson, um, Reeves for teams that took him because they piss people off and they bring energy. But, like, Lindblom's a guy that has the offensive component if you put him in the right spot. Like you said, it's just – I think the Flyers, that they're going to the, the worst coaching strategy I hate the most, which is if the guy's not having success, let's bury him. And then see if he can cover back up in that um, category. And it's like, well, how do you expect the guy to recover when you bury him and you're putting him with guys? Like, I love Zach McEwen and the energy he plays with, but he's not a guy that's going to get you nice saucer pass assists and have these put on your dime right on your tape passes that you can score on. That's not the type of player he is. No, for sure. And it's, you know... It's just frustrating when this is all we talk about is like what needs to be fixed. It's it's so just old, man. It's just old. Yeah, I mean, at least in the like we said, if you get it fixed, the but the biggest key to success, obviously, of any hockey team, no matter what level you're at, is good, consistent goaltending. So you have that. If you can get this fixed in decent order in the month of December, let's say by like the fifth to sixth of December. It's, what, the third today, I think? Second. Second, yeah. So by like the 5th or 6th of December, you you can then kind of start building it back because you have the foundation of the great goaltending. You just have to then figure out the defense and the structure of how everyone's going to be lined up there. And then if the scoring gets going, then you're going to start winning games anyway because it's not like the Edmonton Oilers win because of their damn defense. Then they, they win – they win because their goaltending has been playing well this year. Koskins had a career year, and their offense is great. So as long as you can get your offense going again and you have this good goaltending, you then just have to figure out the defense, and that would make people a lot more happy to then – some will still complain, but most people would be a lot more happy and positive because you would at least be winning games, you get it going, and then you realize, yes, we have to fix the defense, maybe add another guy there as well, but that's something we can do down the line. It won't be – like now where you just can't even point to really much positives in kind of the bleak seven game or losing streak that this team's on that everybody, even teams that have not been like the devils were struggling when they came into play us too. They were sputtering, even took advantage of the flyers. No, for sure. And it's, it's, it's a problem when you continuously can't play to the level of your opponent and you're just, you're not scoring goals and every chance you have is one and done. Cause you can't do anything in this league. If you, that's all you're, you're doing when you're scoring. So. No. 
And um, I think we pretty much uh, covered a pretty good bit of everything here about the Flyers' um, extensive struggles um, recently. We hope, obviously, being more positive people here with uh, Flyers Eddie Gritty, we both do stuff for them and Chris over at Flyers Fan Mania and me at Sports Fanatic News. We turn this around quickly, but um, – to end this video, Chris, for one, do you have any like final three points that you think are the keys to success going forward? And then also tell everybody where they can find you at. Um, if they can get the power play going, if their defense can play better in front of, of harder Jones, depending on who's in net um, and just play for each other. That's, that's the one thing I want to say. Um yeah, my YouTube is uh, Flyers Family Night Three. You can check it out there. I do videos after every Flyers game. Uh, I do Florida podcast with Amadeo. I write for Flyers Nitty Gritty. Do Don't Panic with Yuri for Flyers Nitty Gritty. Um, I do a bunch of stuff. You can find me. Check me out on Twitter. Um, I'm at underscore Chris Mayer, and then my Instagram is the same as my YouTube and Facebook. If anybody uses it, is uh, just just my name, Chris Mayer. And uh, Joe, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for coming on. I know all of us in the hockey season, we're always doing a million different things. So it's great to be able to get us all on each other's shows. I appreciate you for coming on. You can find me at Sports for Ag News, Steel Flyers, and also, of course, over at Flyers Nitty Gritty. And subscribe to all those places as well as Chris's channel, Flyers Fan Mania. Is that the pink Whitney hat, by the way? It is, yeah. That's an awesome hat, too. Um, Ryan, uh, Yeah, Ryan Whitney for people that I almost called him Ray Whitney. Ryan Whitney for people that don't know from the <laughs> Spinning Chicklets uh, podcast with Paul Bizonette. Um, That's a great podcast. Pink Whitney, great drink. Um, but anyway, yeah, I agree with all your um, key takes. The key things for me is the goaltending has to keep rocking the way it is because then that's the key to success if everything gets going around it and the offense gets going. And then third would be Coots and Proveroff kind of finding their game because they haven't been they've been average this season in comparison to their actual careers so if they can come back to what we know that's going to be a huge part in the success but we thank you all for joining us uh, uh, this has been the sports side news the grittiest take as we talk about the flyers woes that we hope turn into the booze turn into cheers going forward for this team hopefully starting against tampa but that's not going to be easy so we'll have to see going forward peace out everybody stay safe and enjoy the great fantastic hockey season